morning, everybody from New Hunter Church of Christ. Hi, this is Michael De Silvas, and I hope everybody's having a wonderful, glorious day. We continue on in our studies in Ephesians chapter two, verses one through ten. Our title of our sermon is entitled "God's Workmanship: How God Works Among Us and What He Does for Us." We'll see that here in a moment. I'm going to read from the New Century Version, uh, verses one through ten of Ephesians chapter two. All right, and the title in my Bible, since I'm reading from the New Central Version, is called, We Now Have Life. Okay, so he was talking, he's talking to Christians that are born again here, and now he's talking about how we were not saved, but yet now we have a newness in life because of Christ being in us, because through baptism. All right, here it goes here, folks. It says, in the past, as Paul speaking, you were spiritually dead because of all your sins, and the things that you did against God's very will. So as yet in the past you lived the way the world lives, following the rules of the evil powers that are above the earth. It says the same spirit is now working in all those who refuse to obey after God's will. It says in the past all of us live like they did or like them trying to please our sinful selves and doing all the things our bodies and minds wanted. It says we should have suffered God's very anger and wrath because we were sinful by nature. We were the same as all the other people. It says, but God's very mercy is great and he loved us so very much. It says, though we were spiritually dead because of the things we did against God, he gave us new life with Christ. And that came through baptism. That's how we got that new life. Um, not by some enlightenment or sprinkling or anything, but through immersion. Um, you have been saved by God's very grace. And he raised us up with him, meaning with Christ, and gave us a seat with him in the heavens. It says he did this all for those who are in Christ Jesus, it says so that for all future time we could show the very great riches of his grace by being kind to us in Christ Jesus. I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourselves, however. No, it was a gift that was given from God. It says it was not the result of your own efforts you know, dead works, you know, it wasn't no dead works here, it says, so you cannot brag or boast about it, it says, God has made us what we are to be, in Christ Jesus, God made us to do good works of righteousness, like Paul and Timothy and James talk about, what I'm talking about, uh, which God had planted, or planned, in advance for us to live out our very lives doing, for him. All right, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day as we come together and we speak about the word and we come around your table humbly with our heads bowed and eyes closed and with a forgiving heart. And then we understand that we need to know that you love us so much, Lord, that you gave your life for us on the cross and that you give us a message of encouragement that we need to press on and be faithful to yours. Lord, I pray that people will be with me be with me during the message and that people will give financially. We really do need it. We need about $236 to go towards our rent. Uh, if people can help, we really would appreciate that $236 gift offering. Um, we hope that people will donate. You can PM me on Facebook, and I hope that you do, or, or call me at 804-789-9373. All right? And uh, Lord, let's hope that people will be challenged and will be encouraged to give to us who watch us faithfully. And thank you, Lord, for everything you do in Jesus' name, All right, so let's get right into it here. All right, we are God's workmanship, just like the title of the sermon says to us this morning. The Apostle Paul it goes on and explains, you know, how we have changed lives and how we bear witness to our Lord's very living power. All right, here Paul also goes to show three phases in which this is visible or evident, okay? 
and the first point of that the first point of that phase is past predicament you know how we were before all right we were living in the flesh the ephesians were dead you know through their sins says this is man's basic problem he or she is a sinner Okay, turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Romans 3, 23. Okay? And it says, Everyone has sinned and has fallen short of God's glorious standard. Okay? And that's true, because we have. And we recognize that sin is as real as cancer is. It devours the body. It devours everything that it comes in contact with. And if we don't, we don't get a control on that, then it will end up killing us literally, physically, and because the wages of sin is death, and that's really the end result of what sin does when it takes a hold of everything. It says, with, every, with even more devastating results, okay, it says, no longer can we have fellowship with God. We are dead. We are separated from Him by our own sins, okay? So, one must face up to the very facts is whether he or she is becoming a member of an organization called Alcoholics Anonymous or is turning to God and finding help with you know people that are believing in God that are helping to support them through friends and family and so forth. Um, the Christian, that's a support system, the Christian must not forget his or her past predicament. Look at Romans chapter 7 verse 18. Romans chapter 7 verse 18. 18 from the New Century uh, edition here, translation, says, Yes, I know that nothing good lives in me. I mean, nothing good lives in the part of me that is earthly and sinful. I want to do the things that are good, but I do not do them. Okay, so that's that's the, the human nature that's in us. Okay. So sin is a real as real as cancer, as we read, and it can really destroy the the body. And uh, and see, uh, as we know, if we we don't have control over what we're doing, then sin will devour the body. And as we just read from Romans seven verse eighteen, uh, we have sinned so long that it has become our natural way of living and doing things. It's like it's become normal. Okay, With some people it has gotten so bad that they don't even realize that they're sinning. Like when people say, you know, that I don't make mistakes or I don't, you know, I don't do anything wrong. You know, you know they're in denial and you know there's something wrong there because they're so used to doing what they're doing, lying and telling stories that they don't even realize it because it's become a normal action of them every day in their lives. So our past associations reveal to us a life that is contrary to God's very will. That's what we read in verses 2 and 3, to save time, of what we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 this morning. It says the results of our predicament, our past predicament, are summarized here in John 3, verse 36. All right, so let's look at that. Turn to John uh, 3 verse 36 it says those who believe in the Son have eternal life but those who do not obey the Son will never have life God's anger stays upon them okay so there you go um, All right, so let's go to the second point. The second phase of what Paul's explaining to us is our present life, where we are right now. God is the one who changed things. Someone once said, mercy pieties, grace pardons. Okay, so he made a new life possible. Look at Romans 5, I mean, Jesus made a new life possible when you were baptized, okay? That's how that was accomplished. So this is written to the Christians after they've been baptized, but it's just explaining 
what people did to get there and kind of giving a picture, painting a, Paul's painting a picture for us. Go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, if you will. All right. It says, but God shows his great very love, shows his very love for us in this way. Christ died for us on the cross while we were still sinners. See, so that says a lot there. Um, so no longer, we're not dead in sin because Christ died on the cross to pay as a ransom for that. It says we are been, we've been raised to a newness of life in Christ Jesus. It says this is being pictured in our baptism into him. Look at Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. It says, So do you think we should continue on sinning so that God will give us even more grace? No. We died to our old sinful lives. So how can we continue living with sin? It says, Did you forget that all of us became part of Jesus Christ when we were baptized. It says we shared in his death and our baptism. Okay? So when we were baptized, we were then buried with Christ and shared in his death. So just as Christ was raised from the very dead by the wonderful power of the Father, we also too can live a newness of life. Okay? So that's that's very important very important right there to realize to note all right so our new life comes from God not by our works you know our man-made carnal works now someone also once said that when thou when you have your best suit on Christian you all remember who paid the price for it okay all right as the old song says, nothing is, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. So the effect of God's action is seen in the way in which we live in our, out our new lives as being a born again baptized Christian. And it's so important to understand there. Um, so in him validates our new birth okay Jesus does that for us we eagerly join in worship study and ministry because of that fact now let's look that brings us to our third phase that Paul talks about and that's future promise what is waiting for us what's 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 happening as a result of us doing these things and following after his will and doing what is what we're supposed to do um, and, it, and that is the promise has two parts to it okay so what he shows and what he and what we show so it's like what he shows and what we show as a result of god being in us he shows the riches of his very grace to us and the blessing we all the blessings we enjoy in this life are only just a taste or just a glimpse or preview of what is yet to come the, of the main attraction folks Okay, salvation is the gift of his very love for us. All right, it says because we believe his promise and trust in him totally to keep his word, we have no fear of future judgment from God because we are living, we're living a proven a testament of that because we're living after his example. Okay. Our salvation is the very gift of God, not of works, I mean man-made works. But if you're doing works of righteousness, that's okay. But man-made works, no, it's not of works. It says, but, but when we are saved, our works, see the works of righteousness there, will reflect on our new relationship with God, okay? So, and so it's like people will argue and say, well, baptism is a work. It's not a work. No, that's something that we do to show obedience to God. That's what I was trying to say last week. So in a way, it is kind of required for us to do that, essentially, because we're trying to show our forgiveness. We're trying to show our obedience to him, and that's what we're told to do is be baptized by immersion. So some people believe that 
that's not possible or that we don't need to do that in order to be saved. But then at the same time, they say they, they agree that if we have baptism in faith then we're, and we get baptized, they agree on that. So I'm kind of mucky on some people how they come up with half of these assertions, but they don't seem to think it all the way through. Because if Jesus says a commandment, then we need to follow it. So therefore, it is required in order to be saved. It's not me saying that, but it's what Christ said. When we do obedience, when God says something to do, and we do it by being obedient to him, then we're doing what he commands. So there you go. All right, so for this very purpose, God created us, as noted in verses 9 and 10 of what we just read earlier. It says, we are not saved simply by doing man-made good works, but as Christians... We must produce good works of righteousness, like what Paul and Timothy talk about, and Peter. As the branch bears fruit, when it is attached to the living vine, so the believer bears, meaning the Christian, bears fruit of the Holy Spirit when he or she is bound to his Lord, or to her Lord. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So a man and his friend, I want to say this little illustration here, were talking as a stranger walked on by. That man has been in the army, one observed. Well, how can you tell that? Well, asked his friend. Says, I can always tell of a soldier by the way he or she walks. Well, the child of God must also show that he or she has left the past of sin and looks forward to a future of hope as he or she serves the Lord in the present. Okay, I have this one final illustration that I would like to read to you, and it's actually based on a true story. And it's called, Hope Makes All the Difference. Okay, In the year... 155 AD, Polycarp was a bishop at Simara, okay, the Roman proconsul before whom he was uh, brought sought to show deference to him because of his age. It says, if you will revel, meaning turn against Christ, then I will set you liberty or I will set you at liberty. So the aged old man, Colibar, Colli, Polycarp, I'm sorry, replied back to him and said, I have served him for over 86 years now, and he has never done me any wrong. He says, how can you re- expect for me to now blaspheme me, my king and my very dear savior? Okay, so the pro there urged him once again, to swear his allegiance by the fort by the f- fortune of Caesar. Caesar, he says, "Don't you realize that I have wild beast at my disposal? And if you do not repent and change your mind, then you will be thrown to them." So Polycarp just said, "Bring them on." Polycarp answered says, we are not accustomed to repenting of goodness in order to do so, so that something evil can continue to happen or happen. Um, see, so we don't sell ourselves to idols, okay? So if you have so much scorn for the beast, perhaps you should prefer the fire, okay? It says, your fire burns for an hour and then goes out said the old man Polycarp, says, but there is another fire you don't know about. Says, what are you waiting for? He asked. Bring forth whatever you like. Okay. And so he met his very death because he dared to live the newness of life that Christ gave him because he was a baptized, changed man. Okay. And of him, and of course all those who are like him, Jesus said, says, though he die, yet shall he live, and yet should he live. 
It says, wait for the Lord. Okay? Because his promises are true, is basically what it's saying there. So that's a big encouragement for us. So when we put our faith and trust in the Lord, we know that his words are not just words that are just coming out, spewing out, you know, just fearlessly in a decorative kind of state or a dead kind of state, but yet his words really are real and that they do have power and they are with force and of victory. And we know that we believe in the Lord that those things will come true and that they will because of what Jesus promises us in the scriptures. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and focus on the Lord's Supper now. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you that we're able to come together, be able to reach, preach and proclaim your word. Hopefully it helps people. Hope the Holy Spirit was able to say something to me in a way that it may help these people out here to better understand the scriptures and that we'll be more in harmony and not not in confusion mode, but yet we'll be able to come in harmony more so. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. And please bless us and help me, Lord, to get the rest of the money for the rent here for this month in uh, in May, as well as for, you know, this, this last month. And thank you for everything that you do and help that people will be challenged to give. And please help us to put our minds and in our hearts on on you as we focus on what you did for us through communion to remind us of why we are baptized, why we are faithful is the reason why we take communion every week. In Jesus, in your wonderful name, I pray, amen. All right, so we have we have two things here. Okay. We have the bread of life and we have the vine of life. So let's talk about the bread of life. Jesus said to us in the temple of Capernaum, as he says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, Take this, for this is my body, for this symbol, uh, this is symbolic of me being really present physically with you. Remember, whatever you do, you represent me as a disciple of Christ, and you are of Christ. So remember that. For therefore, take when you take this, I'm always there with you. So let's do this in remembrance of Him and reflect on those thoughts. Same is also true for the vine of life. Jesus shed His blood, and He spilled it out on the cross so that our sins would be not just forgiven, but they would be erased from the Lamb's book of life. And we would start a new life with Him. Because we were baptized, we can only take communion if we have been baptized, born again. If we're not baptized, then we cannot partake of the Lord's Supper. So if you are taking communion right now and you're not baptized, this does it's just going through the motion. It doesn't have no meaning. If you're already baptized, then yeah, it has a whole new meaning, and it definitely will help you to remember why what Jesus did and why you take it because you truly are a brother or sister of his and you're following of what Jesus did when he died when he was buried and when he was resurrected and that's why we have communion to remind us of that fact and so when we were baptized the same thing happened to us so we didn't have to wait three days to be resurrected into a newness of life that moment when we came out of that water we became a child of his and we were new then but Jesus was prophesied we had to wait he had to wait three days. But Jesus, under his power, we were raised out of that water. We're a new life from that moment on. And God is working to center in us, to change us, to make us more, to make us pure and develop us into something that is holy and useful for his purposes here on earth as well as in the next one to come. And if we remember this fact, that's why we take communion. So let's think about that. Let's partake of this as we reflect on those thoughts as Jesus poured his blood out for us on that cross and as he still does as he covers our sins every time we go to him to, for, to ask for forgiveness because we're not perfect and that's why we still have to do that you know thank you Lord for everything that you do you know this communion was wonderful and that we were able to come together and serve in your glory and to know that you gave us a wonderful message through the sermon that was just done today. And that hopefully it helps people to realize and to know you as your personal Lord and Savior. And salvation is not is a, is a gift that comes from you. It's not something we earn, but it's something that you give us and lavish upon us. And as well as a lot of other gifts like the fruits of the Spirit. Or the fruit of the Spirit. I should say the fruit of the Spirit. And that uh, there's nine qualities that you lavish on us too as a result of being born again and being immersed and being a child of Christ through baptism, that's how we can get those things. We can only do it through baptism, not through some christening, 
not through calling Jesus or praying Jesus in your heart, not some light man or, you know, or going down to the baptistry whenever it's convenient, but we go and do it right away. Just like when all the disciples, when they were baptized, they didn't do it at certain times of the year. They did it all, all the way. And that's the point, the urgency. And that's what you want us to do, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. And please help people to be generous and giving this, this week, this month. So we can meet our goal of getting $236 to pay to cover the rest of our rent and our electric and all. Thank you for everything that people are doing. I love you all. And Jesus, in your wonderful name, I pray, amen. Go out there and fight the devil. Remember, I love you. And uh, thank you for joining us this, this, this day on this wonderful day. Take care and God bless. This is Michael DeSilvis, evangelist for New Hunter Church of Christ. And hey, thanks a lot for all those who give in advance. And uh, take care. I love you now. Make sure you read your Bible faithfully every day. And always go to the Lord for any problems that you have. Don't try to handle those problems unless you seek the counsel of the Lord first. Take care. It's Michael De Silva's. Nothing's too great without the power of the Lord. See you next week with another powerful message from New Hundred Church of Christ.